22nd September, 1914, six o'clock in the morning. A storm that had been raging for weeks in the North Sea had passed and the sea was calm. The First World War had started seven weeks earlier. Three British cruisers, the HMS Abukir, Hogue and Cressy, were patrolling waters between England and the Netherlands. Their most important task, protecting military personnel in their transfer to the European mainland. On board were a total of some 2,300 men, some as young as 15, awaiting their adventure and totally unconscious of what was to befall them. In less than an hour and a half, 1,459 men lost their lives. Mainly reservists, men with families, and 13 teenage boys, Marine officers to be in training. Even today, thousands of British families mourn. For 100 years, the disaster has received little attention. Strange. The number of victims was similar to that of the Titanic disaster of two years earlier. Today, three mass graves lie on the bottom of the North Sea, only 22 miles from the Dutch coast of Scheveningen. How did it happen? And what has happened since to this naval graveyard? one. I think that's him going to Osborne, isn't it? Yes. 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 So there he is in Same his uniform, uniform in the yeah. garden. Ready to go. To... Ready to go. Duncan had decided he wanted to go to sea by the time he was about 11, I think. He was very sporty. He was mm. very quick. He was very able. And I think he had a good deal of natural leadership, so he did, he did very well at Osborne. Yeah. And he was cadet captain, and then um, when they go to sea, he's senior midshipman, senior acting midshipman, because they're not even really midshipmen, mm. they're still boys. Look at this. This, <laughs> this is just like something from Cambridge today. And there he is, there. She's put D above his face. There they all are. They're only very young, aren't they? And... I think that that's the more well, well. That's the one that's I've often used this, because that's yeah. such a beautiful photograph. Yeah. yeah. So how old is he here? He's. I think he's probably about fourteen, don't you? Yeah. Mm. And we've got here 
um, the letters that were sent to him, because this is his writing, this is his letter case. All right. That didn't go to sea with him. Mm. Lots of stuff didn't go to sea. That's why that's we the had stuff it. That's why we have yeah. it. Um, we opened the chest in 1958 and found all these very pathetic mm. things, you know, his handkerchiefs and... His pen. There's the three children together. So that's Duncan. And then yeah. that's Catherine. And that's... That's Hugh. Hugh. Yeah. Friend the crest of run. I oh, know, it's, it's well, clusters. Well, it's clusters. But, yeah. um, but he's, he says on the back here, I'm having a topping time. I have been accused of flirting with a Dutch girl, but it's absolutely untrue. <laughs> <laughs> the runs are mostly on luges. Do you think you could ask Daddy? He's asking the family friend who lives up the road, who's related to his mother. Do you think you could ask Daddy to let me go on a bob with a pro? It's absolutely safe on the run we use, but the people I'm staying with won't take the responsibility. <laughs> and he's put it at the top. You might put it very gently. <laughs> sounds very familiar. <laughs> it does a little no, bit, it doesn't it? Sounds just <laughs> like you. Is Not on a postcard like... these days, but yeah. It's <laughs> very does, like does, you. Yeah. The sentiment yeah. is... They must have been so glad they let him go. Yeah. Afterwards. Yeah, I'm sure. Since 1863, this was the place where Royal Navy officers were trained and educated, inculcated in the ethos and traditional values of the service. The young Duncan had just completed the first half of his training and in 1914 had joined Dartmouth to finish his education. A great privilege for which his family had to pay the equivalent of 8,000 euros a year. Life was Spartan. Personal discipline was important. But it did not discourage the young men. They were motivated and ambitious. The training covered various subjects, plus sport, seamanship, engineering, and drawing. In drawing, the students learned the art of observation, which would be important later in times of conflict. Duncan seemingly had the time of his life. Did you see this book? Which no, is his manual no. of seamanship. Have you never seen that? No, I haven't, no. I That's haven't his manual. That. I've had this since that. I was a child. It's got my name in it somewhere, I think. So what did they have to learn then? But it's got everything. It has how the bedding should be laid out, how to scrub a hammock. <laughs> How to hold up a clean hammock for inspection. Knots. Mobilize, the order that was sent by telegram to the college on the 1st of August, 1914, by the British Admiralty. Within eight hours, 400 students are ready for departure, each with his own sea chest containing all his essential belongings. Ferry and train take them to the North Sea coast where their vessels await them in port. The boys are nervous, but also determined. They are billeted across 10 warships. Duncan and a few fellow students go aboard the Abu Kir, an impressive vessel, 143 meters long and 21 meters in the beam. He was just 15 years old and full of confidence, ready to serve his country. But there is insufficient room for his sea chest. He picks out a few things, and the chest stays behind. We are having a very fine time. This is the 25th of August. After the day's work, we go and do gym on the quarter deck to keep us in training. They took the boys out of Dartmouth and sent them to sea. They, t they made the cadets into acting midshipmen mm -hmm. because they didn't have enough officer cover, I think. So they are very young, small officers. And so they went to sea and they were sent, uh, Duncan was sent to HMS Abukir. So the family won't have seen him after this. Yes. As long as I can remember, I've known that I had this relative who was also called Duncan, and that he died, died when he was 15 in the war. He had an old copy of Captain Scott's 
diary from his time exploring the Antarctic. Again, I think, I think the old Duncan was, was a bit of an explorer, a bit of an adventurer too. So I, I remember there's a, there's a very old book there that, that I, I, I read when I was 15. I think he had a great sense of adventure. I know that he was a very active boy. He loved his, his country pursuits. I think, for me, most of all, really, it was, it was Henk's work in terms of looking at the history of the whole, the whole tragedy. He got in touch with the family. I started to hear a lot more about, about the wreck and about, about the Dutch side of the story as well. In the Netherlands, Duncan meets Henk van der Linden. Henk had recently researched the disaster and written a book about it. At this place of honor, several victims from the three British cruisers found their last resting place. They had been washed ashore at Scheveningen a couple of days after the sinking. So what did you find out about the impact of events, both, both here in the Netherlands and at home for me in, in Great Britain? What did you find here, out here it was big. It was very big. There were several uh, funerals over here. Th these men are all buried with uh, military honors, with over 1,000 uh, soldiers uh, alongside the road to pay them respect. Yeah. It was in all the papers, in all the magazines. In Great Britain, I don't know if it was big. I, I suppose it was very big in the, for, for, the memory, for the families who yeah. suffered. But I understand that the British Navy was not very happy with this uh, accident because of the, the greatness of the loss and, of the, and because of the fact these ships weren't supposed to be in dangerous water. I got an, uh, a, a clipping from a magazine. It was an interview with one who, who lived. And he said, we on the ships, we called our ships suicide ships. So the men themselves knew? We're, we're on suicide ships. They had to be on the ships because of their duty to, to the country. The, yeah. the, so they were there alone. They had no orders to zigzag. They were slow speed, sitting ducks. What were these ships doing? And why were they so vulnerable? According to some senior people in the British government, they should never have been there. One month before the disaster, a senior British officer had written in a letter, why should we give the Germans the slightest chance of a cheap victory? For heaven's sake, bring them back. How impressive the Abukir, Hoag and Cressy actually represented no threat for the enemy. They had a huge crew of 700 and an enormous coal consumption to keep the vessel operational. They sailed only slowly and had no refined targeting system. The crew had no experience with the vessels and had not yet learned to work effectively together. To compensate for the inexperience, professional officers were on board, but this was also not enough. However, this was not the worst. The most important weakness was the poor armor plating below the waterline. It was not designed to protect from mines and submarine attacks. Just before the war, these ships had been part of the reserve fleet. Only a lick of paint and a surface cleanup were to bring them onto a war footing. Because of these weaknesses, they received instructions a couple of weeks before outbreak of war to patrol the area of the Dogger Bank, a relatively safe area far from the strategically critical and more dangerous Straits of Dover. They could only go to sea under the continuous presence of torpedo boats to protect from nearby threats. But things go differently. The ships move indeed into dangerous areas, the Broad 14 closer to Dover. Until the 17th of September, the dangers are to be handled with the torpedo boats as protection. But the weather is bad for weeks on end. The smaller torpedo boats cannot withstand the heavy weather and one by one are sent back to England. The HMS Abukir, Hogue and Cressy remain behind. Their size allows them to weather the rough seas. The top brass of the Royal Navy know the risks. There is talk of live bait. 
and diminished determination to bring them back. They know the enormous risks, but take them anyway. There is no other protection available. There was a sizable body of opinion in the Admiralty, and Churchill himself didn't think the cruisers should be operating in the broad 14s as they were. And they were being called the live bait squadron in those circles. I mean, they were, they were outdated. They weren't so much old as had, been rapid, had become rapidly obsolete. obsolete. Because the pace yeah. of naval technology was changing so rapidly that they were going obsolete very, very they quickly. Were. But the big thing was they didn't have any destroyer, destroyer cover. cover. For two days, the three cruisers sail around the broad 14 as live bait. The captains become ever less attentive. To save on coal, they reduce speed, and they stop defensive zigzagging. Senior officers assume that if a torpedo boat cannot handle the high seas, then neither can a German submarine. The U-9 was but the ninth submarine the Germans had built and the German naval staff still did not have much confidence in it. The sub was too small, with only 28 men and six torpedoes. There was little experience in wartime operations. But Captain Otto Wedichen thought otherwise. He knew he had a powerful weapon at his disposal. On the 20th of September, he had the chance of a lifetime. He could leave on patrol with the U-9. From the port of Heligoland, he and his confident crew left direction Belgium to prevent British troops landing on the mainland, but not knowing that an ultra-vulnerable easy target would simply appear before him. The German sub-commander was determined on a successful mission. The U-9 was his world. Ja, was soll ich sagen? Ich habe ihn ja nicht gekannt. Ich kann nur so sagen, dass er sehr ein sehr geliebter Sohn war. Auch, ja. Er hatte viele Freunde und war sehr sportlich. Wir wissen, dass er der Jüngste von zehn Kindern gewesen ist. Und äh, von ihm wird gesagt, er sei ein richtig lustiger, frecher Vogel gewesen. Er hat ja an der Schule wohl keine große Freude gehabt. Er ist dann mit der prima Reife abgegangen und ist dann zur Seefahrt gegangen und er hat da also die Karriere gemacht. Er hätte nicht woanders hingehen können, weil er nicht adelig war und auch nicht super reich. Vielleicht muss man doch ein sehr großes Selbstbewusstsein oder eine Selbstsicherheit mitbringen, wenn man so eine... Sache über die Bühne bringen will. Ein Selbstbewusstsein, das kommt, wenn man ein geliebtes Kind ist und wenn, man, wenn, eine, wenn alles um einen herum stimmt. Wir waren ja auch alle sehr christlich erzogen. Ja, es wird mir schon nichts passieren. Und wenn, dann hat es nicht anders sollen sein. So ungefähr stelle ich mir den vor. Wenn man in so ein kleines U-Boot steigen will, wenn man sich vorstellt, wie, wie eng das da drin war. Viel enger als heute. Also da muss man sich schon mit allen gut verstehen. Die haben ja geschlafen auf den Torpedos. Das, ich habe mal ein, einen Prototyp von diesem U-Boot gesehen in München im Deutschen Museum. Das kann man sich nicht vorstellen, wie eng das da war. Und das dann, diese kleine Kiste und dann unter Wasser. Ich glaube, ich, ich hätte es nicht ausgehalten. This is your great great grandfather's diary. Duncan's laugh could be heard all over the ship. Duncan had been perfectly happy at sea the whole time, was never sick and always cheerful. The night before the disaster, Hughes had spent a long time with Duncan and said he was in splendid spirits. They know what happened to them because of Kit Wickham Musgrave. And Kit Wickham Musgrave survived. Uh, he was picked up unconscious by the Titan. Okay. Hours later, one of, one of the Dutch trawlers picked him up. 
he and Duncan had gone into the water when the abacu was hit. They had nearly made it to the Hogue when she was hit. And then they were picked up by the Cressy. I think they were hauled aboard by a rope. Mm. So they get on board the Cressy and they're having hot cocoa wrapped in blankets when the Cressy is hit. Mm. And Duncan and Gore Brown were the best swimmers of their term, of their year. And they had an oar between them and they took the oar to try to help a sailor who was going under and panicking. But they're only quite small boys and in his panic he grips them and he pulls, he pulls them down with him, a wave takes them, I think. And so that was the last Wickham Musgrave saw of them. He wasn't just a 15-year-old that was caught in a terrible disaster. He was a 15-year-old who was caught in a terrible disaster and then died with a friend trying to save someone else in that same disaster. I, I definitely think that that's a, that's a really heroic way for him to go, but a, a boy so young with another boy so young trying to help a grown man survive in a, in a disaster like that I think is, is really impressive. Duncan cannot be saved. He drowns in the cold water. There are only 833 survivors of the disaster, saved by two Dutch merchantmen and some British fishing boats. In neutral Holland, the survivors are cared for and interned. A number are taken to hospital, frozen and wounded by some horrific explosions on board. In England, the Stubbs family received the terrible news. They'd all had such a happy, jolly day, and they had no idea that that morning Duncan had died. And then he, it says he'd, he went back, because he was living in camp, he went back to the lodgings to get his wife and his daughter to go for a walk. It says, as I entered the gate, Mr. Bell, the owner of the house, had a newspaper in his hand he was very white and looked much distressed when he saw me. I guessed in a moment. He asked me to go into the house and then asked the name of the ship our boy was on. I told him he showed me the paper in which the stop press news that the Abukir had been sunk by a torpedo, nothing further. So then Major Stubbs, um, decides that he won't tell his wife, Madge, straight away. He's going to find out more information. And while he's doing that and getting a newspaper which has been come to press later, Mr Bell appears in the camp and says, um, your wife's found out because her sister had read it in the press. Avril had sent a, let a telegram saying, have you any news of Duncan? So then Madge mm. discovers her boy's they don't know if he's alive or dead. No, they and don't know yet. They don't know. And while there's all these adults in shock, little Catherine, aged mm. nine, unnoticed by anyone, picks up the newspaper oh, no. in the hall and reads it for herself. How did they find out for sure whether, whether Duncan had died? They waited overnight to see if he'd been one of the people picked up. And the next morning, they got the telegram from the Admiralty saying that he hadn't been saved. So they had a list of those that had... They think very quickly they, they knew who they'd got. Yeah. And then they waited to see if his body was found. Did it ever show up? No. No, his no. body was never found. Warum die drei? Ja, stehen da drei Riesentanker. Ich treffe den einen, dann versuche ich den anderen auch und den dritten auch. Ich weiß nicht. Ich habe den Eindruck, das war jetzt einfach mal ein Versuch einer sportlichen Höchstleistung. Ja, das würde ich sagen, das ist eine allgemein menschliche 
ein menschlicher Ehrgeiz, wenn ich das jetzt geschafft habe, dann versuche ich das noch und das auch noch. Das ging ja innerhalb von, ich weiß nicht, sehr kurzer Zeit. Was da dann jeweils zwischendrin passiert ist, das hat er vielleicht gar nicht mitgekriegt. Diese Kriegshandlung äh, gehörte ja dann sozusagen zu seinem Beruf, den er sich ausgesucht hatte. Wenn ich zur See fahre und habe da ein Torpedo und soll damit was machen, dann mache ich das. Dann ist das sozusagen mein, meine Aufgabe, so grausam das ist. Was dann nachher daraus wird, das müssen wir alle verkraften und ertragen. Ich könnte natürlich sagen, warum bist du zur See gegangen? Und das war aber die Karriere, die für ihn in Frage kam, wo, wo er eine Chance hatte. Die Marine war ja ganz jung und ganz neu. Zu Kriegsbeginn war die Marine, oder zumindest die U-Boot-Waffe, mehr ein Spielzeug, also wurde nicht sehr ernst genommen, dass man damit richtig Krieg führen konnte. Und nachdem das schon passiert war, dass da so ein kleines U-Boot drei riesengroße äh, Schlachtschiffe versenkt, da war plötzlich äh, der, große, der Jubel groß. Der war natürlich übernatürlich groß, weil zu dem Zeit hatte man den Eindruck, jetzt kann uns gar nichts mehr passieren, jetzt äh, werden wir überall liegen. Und da war er dann der ganz große Held. Was er da angerichtet hat, das ist ihm vielleicht erst später klar geworden. Das könnte sein. Er wollte nicht als Held durch die Gegend gefahren werden. Das, hat er, das war ihm schon, äh, schon unangenehm. Und dann meine ich ja, dass das eine Waffe war, das wusste er vielleicht selber nicht, dass das eine Massenvernichtung war, die er bestimmt nicht, ich weiß nicht, wenn er es gewusst hätte, ob er, ob er sich dann, ob er das gemacht hätte, weiß ich nicht. Wenn er gewusst hätte, was er da anrichtet. Die waren alle kaisertreu. Ja, die Nazis haben sich seiner bedient, nicht? Die haben aus ihm einen riesen Seeheld gemacht. Das wäre, er, hätte er da für, die, für das Dritte Reich gekämpft, so ungefähr. Es war ja, ich glaube, es ist ein Verlobungsfoto gewesen. Und ähm, da hat man später eben äh, Foto, fotomechanisch äh, die, die Orden noch nachträglich draufgebracht. So how much of this did you know when you were growing up? Not very much at all. Uh, my grandmother never talked about it, as far as I can remember. And my father told us roughly, you know, what had happened. I always knew what had happened. There was always a photograph of Duncan in the house, and I knew about the sinking. You knew the story, the, yes. the, the, the outline and, story. And that he drowned when he was 15. But apart from that, and my father telling me about what had happened when he was told about it by his headmaster. See, when my father first heard about his brother dying, he just started at his public school. How old was he then? When... 13. He was 13. And the headmaster was going to tell him about his brother. At first, he couldn't even begin to tell him, I don't think, because there was this pathetic little red-haired, skinny little shy boy. <laughs> <laughs> didn't want to tell Just him. Just started. But it did in the end. And of course, nobody else had lost anybody then. No, it was before it was right the, the By the waves. time he left yeah. the school, everybody had had somebody in their family lost in the war. So what happened with the chest then? You're... Oh, the chest, yes. Well, the chest was always there, but nobody looked at not it. Not to be it, opened. Not to be opened. It was in the sort of attic part above our garage in this big house we lived in then. And then... In 1958, when my grandmother died in March, your grandfather and I opened the chest, and we were just amazed to find what was in. And I found it absolutely fascinating to read these things and see these photographs and find out so much about what had happened and as well about my grandfather, who I never knew, because he died before, he died before I was you were born. born. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and he's become very much alive to me, which is That's really nice. nice. The chest was emptied and kind of put into a different chest. Since I share his name, my mum always said that the, you know, the chest would be mine to look after. I, obviously, I feel a duty to, to look after it and, and pass it through the generations. I don't know if you'd realised, I only found out very recently quite how, how close to the coast they are. They're actually shallow enough to scuba dive. So, yeah, so they're, they're, they sit in about 30, 35 metres of water, I believe. I would quite like to go and see them myself. They look from, from the videos just such a place of life that I think it would be really nice to, You're going to, to go, go and down see and them, see them, aren't you? Oh, <laughs> well, um, you would, wouldn't you? <laughs> I guess I, I think it might help reconnect a little with the past and help me think a little bit about what it was like for him all, the, all those years ago. I, I'm sure before the war, everything seemed just as it did now. And then in a handful of months, suddenly he, he found himself out there. So I hope it gives me a sense of maybe what it was like for him. From what I've seen from the letters, his, his sense of adventure, his, his willingness to try new and, and slightly dangerous things is, is definitely something I share. I, I guess I, I really hope that if he were here, he'd be really glad that I was going to dive down to the wreck. I'm quite excited, really. I, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to the dive. Yeah. I do like to believe that he would be pleased that I'm doing it. Here I have the map yeah. of the North Sea. And now we start in Scheveningen, that's the port. Yeah. And we have a small boat, the Aquila. And we go with the Aquila, we go in this direction and here. Here they are. Yeah. Are the cruisers. So yeah. how, how far is this then? That is about 22 nautical miles. That means about 40 kilometers. And we need a sailing time of about four hours. OK. And how deep are the wrecks then? The bottom is about 32, 33. Yeah. And on top of the wrecks, we are 27, 26 meters. Yo! It's quite strange being here, really. Even, even on the surface, it's strange to know that this, this is where it happened. It, yeah, I, I think it's remarkable. As you say, 100 years ago, no one was diving these things. And I, I guess even now, it's kind of astonishing that this is something that is there. That, that I can go down and have a look at. I think, I mean, it's my first time in the North Sea. Everyone says, <laughs> says that's a little bit different. Oh, you know, I've got great people around me. I'm sure it'll all be fine. But there's obviously a lot to think about. It does look like it's going to happen, doesn't it? I, I will admit that now, yes. <laughs>
Until the 1950s, no one knew where the wrecks of the Abukir, Hoag, and Cressy actually lay. The residents of the wrecks were left in peace. But in 1955, their location is determined. The British government decides to sell the wrecks to a German steel company. The salvage firm starts its work well. It sends divers below to place explosives, but there is little experience with diving at this depth. One diver suffers the bends, decompression sickness. He survives, but gives up the profession. The salvage work progresses with difficulty. The North Sea is one of the toughest in the world. There are strong currents. With the greatest difficulty, two bronze pieces of some 25 tons are brought to the surface. The company has more problems. The salvage vessel, with two tons of explosives on board, is not allowed to enter the port of Scheveningen. There is further criticism from England. People expect a touch more sensitivity from the British government. When two crew are injured, the German salvage efforts are stopped. It's uh, macabre, ne? It's doch macabre. Erstens mal sollte man damit sowieso nicht Handel treiben. Das finde ich schrecklich. Und wenn da einer das bergen soll, dann sollen das die Opfer tun, also in dem Fall die Engländer. Nein, also sowas tut man nicht, ne? Das tut man nicht. Es ist natürlich jetzt noch irgendwie noch schlimmer, weil die Deutschen die versenkt haben. Und trotzdem würde ich sagen, die Engländer sind jetzt zunächst einmal schuld, denn sie, können, sie hätten sie auch vielleicht an jemand anders noch verkauft, der vielleicht noch mehr, vielleicht waren die Deutschen, die am meisten Geld dafür gaben, ich weiß es ja nicht. Ja, das sind alles so Nachkriegsereignisse oder Folgen. 45 war der Zweite Weltkrieg vorbei. Da waren vielleicht noch die Leute schrecklich, äh, noch, hatten noch irgendwie keine Sensibilität für das, was alles passiert war. Sie waren vielleicht alle total verhärtet oder abgehärtet. Why? Ridiculous. How much did they get for them? Yeah. It all seems so. <laughs> It's almost so petty, doesn't it? What But, was the point I mean, of it? There's sums of money involved. Uh, Britain was very desperate for cash, wasn't it? It seems so funny, doesn't it, that you've got a government, the government of which Churchill was a part in the, just after the war, at the end of the war, is giving out memorial medals like this. How much scrap to the families of people who've lost You know, that's in memory of John Duncan Stubbs. And then, and then, then selling. Thing. And then they're selling, selling the, the grave. Sounds it's a bit strange, mm -hmm. isn't it? As a result of new diving and salvage technology, the number of wrecks being salvaged in the North Sea over recent decades has risen significantly, in spite of Dutch and English protests. Not a single wreck in the Dutch sector of the North Sea is properly legally protected. The lucrative salvage business continues, and historically important wrecks disappear at an alarming rate. And when they this sack open, it's the same flatterer. When they do it wrong, just because there are some metal pieces and some copper pieces. Kann man doch nicht machen. Je länger ich darüber nachdenke. Man kann da kein Kreuz drauf bauen und so hoch machen und sagen, seht ihr, hier, hier liegt die Avokia. Das kann man ja nicht machen, ne? Leider. When there's so many people Living. whose bodies weren't even found and so many people who remember yes. those who died. So are they going to be able to designated as a war grave. 
don't think we know. I think people are trying to get that. Yeah. Because some wrecks are war graves, aren't they? Yes. So that you then people wouldn't be able to go and take, take it for things scrap. from them. Yeah. But nowadays, people take things for scrap and they take them off war memorials in villages. Yes, they do now, because the price of scrap is so high. But I think as well that if, if the wrecks are the place where the sea life has a sanctuary, mm. that must be so, that's so important nowadays. I mean, it's one of the, the lovely things about it, is to think that a place where people died is a yes, place where all this right, life all is living. This, and it's all so beautiful. Every Saturday in Rochester Cathedral, victims of the British Navy are commemorated. In 2012, the families of those lost in the three World War I cruisers come together for the first time, almost 100 years after the disaster. They had spoken little of the tragic events of the past, but now the stories come. They request recognition and demand an honorable burial. Since the day that the crews played the role of live bait in the North Sea, they feel that the victims have been disrespectfully treated. Turn the pages, please, gentlemen. O eternal Lord God, who through many generations has united and inspired the members of our Corps, grant thy blessing we beseech thee on Royal Marines serving all around the globe. Bestow thy crown of righteousness upon all our efforts and endeavours, and may our roles be those of gallantry and honour, loyalty and courage. We ask these things in the name of him whose courage never failed, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. There are still many unanswered questions about the disaster, the sale of the vessels in the 50s, and the salvaging occurring even today. Most of the crews of the Abukir, the Hogue, and the Cressy gave everything they had. The men and boys had honorably served their country. The wrecks on the bottom of the North Sea quickly found a new life. They became magnificent artificial reefs, birthing places for fishes, sources of food, and hiding places for numerous forms of sea life. It was amazing. It was amazing. Thank you so much, Ben. I saw so much. I mean, it's it's like a city down there. It's just, it's so vast. There's, there's arches to swim through. There's, there's whole piles of, of live munitions still down there. And there's just wildlife everywhere. It's, it's incredible. I, I feel amazing. I'm, I'm so pleased we did that. These were were three ships where, at the time, I think it was the greatest, the greatest loss of life in 
a single, you know, in a single day in naval history, as far as I'm aware, for the British. So it, it just seems unnecessary for what can, you know, in the grand scheme of things, be a relatively trivial amount of money that, that they should disturb a war grave just for, you know, the, the scrap metal in an anchor. It's really fitting that a place where so many people lost their lives is now home to so much life of a, of a very different kind.